Thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to welcome Rachel Woodbrook from the University of Michigan to present on the accessibility data primer that she was an author on. Rachel, please take it away. Thank you, Michaela. Let me just try and get that up. Can you all see just the slide now? Yes. Perfect. I'm also going to set a timer for myself. All right. Um, yeah, thanks, Michaela. As you mentioned, uh, my name is Rachel Woodbrook. I work at the University of Michigan Library, and today I'm going to briefly introduce a primer on the topic of curating data for accessibility. Very briefly, background, the idea for this work began in 2020. A research project I was working on identified a gap in the literature on the intersection between like data management and accessibility. And I was supervising a wonderful student assistant, Emily Oxford, who is the primary author on the primer, um, who was interested in doing a summer internship. And so I pulled together um, an internship for her on this topic based on our previous connection with the DCM. Although accessibility is a commonly used word in the context of data management, it's important to clarify that it has most often been used in a more general sense of data that is findable, to use the FAIR framing, um, and widely available. So this does include considerations such as indexing, open formats, and avoiding paywalls. However, accessibility that explicitly takes into account the needs of a range of potential users, including those with disabilities or neurodivergence, is most often not included in this approach. And this shortfall points to a need to push the idea of accessibility further in our work. So in addition to the list on the left here under available, this includes things on the right under accessible, such as checks on data's compatibility with assistive technologies, effective use of design, such as color contrast or font legibility, and alternatives to visual presentations of information. I do also wanna take this opportunity to say uh, Accessibility is a spectrum and many of the practices data curators routinely use and advocate for, such as well-formed data, sufficient documentation, preservable formats, and functional and commented code, um, and even just including full underlying data rather than just images of figures, are our prerequisite for this type of accessibility as well. Um, after all, we strive for machine readability and assistive technologies are most often machine-based. I also want to highlight some of the reasons I think this has not been explored more thoroughly before. Although Emily did find some published work on specific considerations for the intersection of data management and accessibility in this sense, there really was very little available. Um, I do think this is changing, and there's a bibliography at the end of the primer with some useful reading as well. There's also the issue that many curators and researchers already feel over capacity. How many data sets do we see or produce that actually follow all the best practices? Um, time, money, and expertise, I think we all know are constraints. And the reality is that change happens over time. And as data professionals who do research or education and advocate for best practices, we're especially well-placed to help people realize that things need to change. Um, and so I think this is just to point out that we shouldn't feel intimidated just because it feels large and complex. It is, however, truly complex. Um, accessibility for web content has been defined and refined over time by many people working together, and that's a lot of what Emily pulled on uh, or built on. But data as a category is, of course, extremely heterogeneous and has many layers to consider. Um, and actually, one of the biggest challenges in creating the primer was figuring out how to structure it. So I'll show you in a moment the first and robust section talks about accessibility for different types of files, um, for example, plain text, images, things like that. But data sets with multiple interacting file types, um, specialized programs, or database files, not to mention platforms and repositories built on them, turned out to be out of scope for this effort. So here's a very brief preview of the table of contents. We really wanted this to be something where readers could get an overview and then jump to the pieces of the primer that were relevant to them or to a particular data set. And our hope is that even though this primer is pretty long, you don't have to read it through uh, and that it will provide a starting place for curators who are interested in accessibility but may not know what to look for. I also want to say that even more than some other primers, this speaks to actions that often need to be taken during the creation of a data set um, and can't be done sometimes without the subject expertise of the researcher. So I do think it's relevant to a variety of situations, including potentially sharing with researchers who are willing to, um, to think about this. And then finally, I wanted to just real quickly um, share some of the key curation questions 
to give you an idea of where we suggest people start. And those would include things like what types and files of data are included in the data set, what types of accessibility even apply or most relevant to ensure, um, knowing your audience can be helpful there as well. What are applicable accessibility best practices for the data set or for the file formats? And if there aren't any, um, what alternative practices might you be able to think of to make it more accessible? Are appropriate metadata present in the right format and location, including accessibility metadata where appropriate? And this is something you might be able to ask the depositor, has the data set already been tested for accessibility in any way using either an assistive technology, uh, software built in an accessibility, software built in accessibility checker, or a web-based or other accessibility checker um, where, where possible and appropriate. So it's a very high level overview, of course, um, but I also wanna point to the future in addition to future updates for the primer, and I hope that folks will build on this by contributing accessibility sections for other primers. Um, Emily did also create one for the R primer that you can also view. Um, the last section of the primer or Appendix A, I think, specifies areas where more work is needed. Um, and there are quite a few. Um, and this is not actively under development, but if you have interest or expertise and would like to contribute in any capacity, or if you have feedback, um, I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, I just put this in the chat, but for just to say it out loud, please hold all questions until the end, but you can also put them in the chat as we go. Next up, we are going to hear from our column, column binary data curation primer authors, Jessica Ko and Kelsey Norick. Hello all, um, I'm gonna share my screen in just a second here. Okay, there we go. Um, so good afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, my colleague, Kelsey Norick and I are senior data curators from the Roper Center for Public Opinion Research. And as some of you may know, um, the Roper Center is an independent and nonprofit organization. And it's the oldest archive of public opinion data in the world, um, founded in 1947 with data dating back to 1935. Um, and with data dating so far back, um, we still have a number of studies that remain unconverted in column binary format and not enough funding to convert them all on our own. Um, this slide here, for example, shows the number of unconverted column binary studies we currently have in IPOL, um, which is our archival database. This served as the biggest motivator for our decision um, to develop a primer so that we could uh, collaborate and um, collaborate with and teach other institutions to convert them as well. So for those who aren't familiar, column binary is a file format that was once frequently used to store survey data from punched cards, which are paper cards in which holes are punched to represent data points. There are different types of punched cards, um, but the 80 column IBM card is one of the most common. The columns represent variables, and the rows represent possible responses. There's space for 12 possible response values, 0 through 9, plus space for two additional punches directly above the 0. If you try to open a column binary file on one of today's computers, you'll see something like this. Um, so obviously, you can't um, use that as is. And so in order to be able to use it, um, it needs to be converted to a modern data format. Converting column binary is an esoteric and involved process. Um, this slide shows the life cycle of a converted column binary file um, from its origination in a punched card to then column binary data and then to a converted but uncleaned modern data format. Um, in this picture, it's an SPSS file. And finally, to a cleaned and converted file. Now I'll hand things over to Kelsey, um, who will give you a brief overview of the steps we go through during the conversion process. 
Thanks, Jessica. Um, so I'm going to give a brief overview of the column binary conversion process using the curate steps, which are found in Appendix A of the primer. Um, the first step is to check that the data file is actually a column binary file. Column binary files typically have um, .colbin or .bin extensions, um, and these um, are shown here. Um, sometimes you will also see um, extension names that begin with C followed by a series of numbers that identify the data set. Um, in addition to looking at the file extension, the curator can try opening the file in text editing software um, to confirm that it's not actually a text file with an unusual extension. To understand the data set, curators use SAS to create an X-ray file, which shows the structure of the data. And SAS is also used to bring the raw data into SPSS or another statistical program. The curator then checks the X-ray against the study codebook and checks the codebook for missing information. Due to the historical nature of column binary files, it's often not possible to request information directly from those um, who are involved in creating the data set, but published resources like books and articles may help fill in gaps in information. Um, augmenting the data involves uh, recoding variables and applying variable and value labels based on column locations and codes in the available documentation. Additionally, metadata associated with the data set is updated. Uh, after the file has been converted, it should be saved in multiple data formats, such as SPSS, Stata, and CSV, to provide greater accessibility. Additionally, any paper documentation should be scanned and made available. Finally, uh, the data set should be evaluated for fairness. The data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So this primer describes the features of column binary files, highlights key considerations in working with these files, provides a step-by-step -step guide to the conversion process, and offers recommendations for developing metadata and for documenting the curation process. Uh, the target audience includes uh, historians, public opinion researchers, uh, political scientists, etc. So uh, looking forward, uh, we could expand on the information in this primer by creating um, detailed guides for uh, converting column binary files using specific software. Um, it would be particularly valuable to have a guide for converting column binary files using R um, because that would remove the barrier of needing access to proprietary software um, like SPSS. Um, Thank you for your time, um, and I uh, look forward to any questions you may have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jessica and Kelsey. So we are halfway through. We've got two more primers to show off. And up next, we have our archaeology data primer. Maria, I believe you'll be screen sharing. Yes, let me share my screen. OK. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Maria. I will be presenting today with Hollis and Rachel, and we're going to be sharing our work on the archaeology data primer. OK, I'll begin with our process. So our group approached this primer from diverse perspectives. Uh, not all of us directly worked with this type of data. So we played into the individual strengths and experiences that we had. Uh, we also were coming in on a volunteer basis. So having well-structured and meaningful um, process was really important. So ultimately our process was in phases, which began after the curated workshop, which was back in October of last year. And directly after we started to have regular meetings where we discussed achievable goals to accomplish by the next meeting. Um, in the first phase, we embarked on a literature review. This was followed by the creation of the primer and then finally by a blind peer review. And through this process, um, to Rachel here, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about the considerations that we, we had to, to deal with. Um, unlike other primers that deal with specific data formats, data types, this archaeology primer really had to focus on the content of, of the data. So archaeological data contains all sorts of data types depending on 
what the investigation or the researcher is dealing with. So you can find data types, data sets, GIS, 3D reports. And so really early on, we, we really decided to think about it in the sense of how are we going to frame this primer to, to kind of cover common formats, but also think about the, com the content of this data. And this really thinks about um, going at it at really meeting archaeologists where they are at um, and providing these recommendations. And so for the common types that we, we recommend, we use the Library of Congress and a specific archaeological guide called the Guides to Good Practice that helped us through this process of creating this primer. In the primer itself, in addition to these recommended formats, we included discussions on repositories, thinking about repositories that are specific to this type of data, metadata categories, example archaeological data collections, and really focusing on resources for further reading. Another important section that we decided to include was legal and ethical considerations to this type of data. Archaeological data contains sensitive personal data, cultural data, and site location that by law, especially in the US and in other countries, are restricted from public use. So in dealing with this type of data as curators or as archaeologists, that data has to be protected. And so we decided to put that discussion um, on confidentiality and redactions for this purpose. And then in the next slide, I'll pass it to Holly to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, I'm Holly. Um, we wanted to address the crossover um, between archaeological data and the care principles. Um, and especially given that the care principles primer had not yet been published at this time, it is is now published. And as you can see, we included a link and it looks like Michaela has dropped that into the chat as well. Um, so of course we strongly encourage you to check out that primer for more about the care principles, but we did want to look at how um, archeological data specifically um, should be approached with the care principles in mind. Um, uh, for any of you who are not familiar with the CARE principles, um, the, the acronym is Collective Benefit, Authority to Control, Responsibility, and Ethics. And um, archaeological data often deals with um, indigenous populations that are still um, here and still deserve to have autonomy over their data. And so um, each data set needs to be approached differently and with these principles in mind. Um, we found that the particular types of data, like we, sh especially if there were GPS data and location data, um, that is something that should be specifically addressed. Um, anything culturally specific um, should also be um, handled with care. The more documentation um, included, the better, especially in data that may be potentially reused. Um, informed consent is crucial uh, in making sure that all data is, is handled in a way that is respectful um, and pre predicting and mit mitigating possible harm um, in the future uh, when making decisions about the use of the data. And I, and I think with that, we, 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 you will, as you read through the primary, you will find these different sections and really have it as a guide um, with these additional resources that we provided. Um, through this process, we also wanna thank our contributors, um, our DCM mentor and our external reviewers for their helpful comments throughout this process. Um, and then in the next slide, you can find our contact information if you wanna find out more or any specifics on that. Thank you all so much. All right, we have our last primer for you all is our audiovisual primer. Lauren, I think you are presenting. I am, I will get my screen ready. Okay, all right. So thank you uh, for coming today. 
I will be talking about audiovisual data curation and the primer that my group wrote. So this is our team. Um, it was Medina, Meg, and me, and we came together in October of 2022 to write this, uh, to go to a DCN workshop um, to get trained. And then out of that, we um, decided on the audiovisual um, format to do for a primer. So audiovisual data is complicated in a lot of different ways, but one of the main reasons it's complicated is because the data is actually like a video payload that has different components. So it has audio, it has captions, it has time codes. Um, it has a lot of different elements that are not, um, that can be really complex and bring in a lot of a lot of different ways that things can go wrong. And all honesty, you have to have a little bit of like some like an electrics engineering background, it seems like uh, to have to a really good knowledge of this type of information. Um, our primer focused specifically on the largest challenges that people would come into contact with when using when curating AV data, specifically in a research standpoint. So it's not just any type of audiovisual data. This is date. This is research data that you would come in contact with in your job as a curator for some type of um, research institution. And we limited our scope specifically to anything that had previously been digitized or was now a born digital material. So it started off um, already in the digital world. We weren't going to talk about digitization. That's a whole nother thing. And we didn't have time to do that. So we um, create a, created a curated specific checklist that can be used by curators who want to review audiovisual formats. And one task that I will point out in the understand step is the review the video payload information to check formats, codecs, et cetera. Um, the curated process obviously is not unique to what curators do with other file formats, but we have specific steps because of the software and method of checking files that may, are gonna be very different than what many are used to. And I'll go over some highlights of the primer. Um, one of the big things that we focused on was ethical issues, specifically around human participants. Um, they are very, one of the big areas that people have been doing audiovisual data is in behavioral research. Um, if you've ever heard of data brary, um, that is a, um, a basically a repository where they do behavioral psychology and they it's a repository specifically for recordings of uh, interactions, especially with babies. So like with their facial expressions and how they react. So it is, uh, it is decently common to use that as a form of research data. Um, and you need to consider when thinking about ethical issues for human participants, what the reuse is going to be, how it's going to be made available. Is it gonna be restricted? Is it gonna be public use? Are you gonna have like some kind of combination? Um, because it really, these are people's faces and it's, you really can't de-identify with any level of um, success and still keep the data, when, especially when it's social sciences and that is the data that you need. Um, you also have to ask yourself, what data will it, how will it be utilized? What is the purpose for it? Um, are you gonna have different types of data use agreements that need to be given for different use types? Or are you using data for machine learning? That's gonna have a different data use agreement than if you're gonna have it for, um, you're gonna be doing like coding for facial expressions and like when somebody laughs or when somebody smiles, you do different codes for that. It's gonna be very different and also consider like what are the types of data that a researcher has been given permission to share when doing their research and what level they got uh, permission from participants. So did they say they're gonna have like their faces shown? Are they just gonna have transcripts? These are all things that we need to really consider. The other um, highlight we talked about is the technical concerns. So you really have to have a lot of expertise it is beneficial to have a lot of expertise um, when working with audiovisual data. You don't have to have that to curate it, but it will help you and you do get better over time. 
Um, but especially if this is really what you're going to be doing is audiovisual data and working with it and transforming it specifically, you need to have some expertise. Um, it also takes specific software. There's a lot of open access ones out there, though, because audiovisual community does a lot of open access work. Um, and it just takes so much space that these are things you really need to consider before actually getting to the curation phase and agreeing to do it. Um, other things you need to ask is, how are you going to get the files from the depositor? Because sometimes they're really large and you can't actually just transfer that over whatever Wi-Fi you have. Um, and what is the level of curation that's needed? Sometimes they expect you to fix things. And these are sometimes things that cannot be fixed with the level of expertise you have. Um, and obviously, is there storage? Um, there's different things about documentation that uh, need to be submitted by the depositor. You need to have, they need to have like a really good readme file, um, but also documentation from human subjects. So it needs to be very in depth about what is the documentation from those human subjects to make sure that you're going about it the right way. And there's a lot of internal documentation that you as a curator need to keep. Um, data use agreements, uh, obviously any logs, but especially logs about any edits that you've been doing to the audiovisual data, which can like increase and you can get a lot of those, but you really need to log them because they can get like, it's one of those things like you do something small and you're kind of like, I can't come back from that. What did I do? Um, user agreements, manifests, and any preservation documents like checksums. Um, there's also some special considerations. Uh, we really talked about having a communication dialogue with the depositor because this is something that's going to take a while to do. And it does, it is a, a communication talking about like, where did you get this? Do you have permission to use this? What was the collection like? Um, talked about staffing requirements. A lot of us are pulled pretty thin right now. Um, and so making sure that it's like we have enough time and expertise and brain power to be able to do it. And also preservation actions because there is a lot of different steps you may have to take to make sure that this can be saved over time. And here are our references. And thank you very much. Uh, these are emails and feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Stop Thank sharing. you so much, Lauren. You're getting a lot of clapping emoji. And I'm sure we are all clapping for not only you, but also all of our presenters.